Hey, Sierra Church family. Um, glad to be with you, sort of. It's uh, kind of strange not seeing your smiling faces out here in front of me, but it really is a blessing that we can at least connect this way and stay in touch with one another and continue sharing God's word with one another. Uh, before we get into John chapter 4, we're going to be looking at today, I want to just remind you that you can get the audio, video, the notes, the slides, all of it online uh, for the message and the music. Um, all you have to do is go on to our website and follow the directions there. It's really easy to find. There's also an option for online giving, which uh, our missionaries and uh, our creditors would appreciate uh, your continued support in that. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, before we get in, let's, let's pray. Lord, um, thank you for this medium that we can still share your word with one another. Uh, I, after this study of John, man, I am just amazed at the content of it and what you have just chosen to share with us and, and reveal to us. And the depths of it, it just keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper. I pray that you would open our eyes to be able to see this incident in John with new, new vision, new, new eyes. And I pray that you would uh, enable us to put these things to work in our life. In Christ's name, amen. Well, when I was in college, back when the earth's crust was still cooling, um, we translated the Gospel of John in second year Greek because the vocabulary and the sentence structure is so simple. Well, the grammar of John might be simple, but I'll tell you, its content is anything but, and we're going to see that here in chapter 4 as we go through this. And I want to pick up the story where Dan left off last week at verse 5. And uh, first, though, I think we need to uh, remember the chapter opens up with Jesus leaving Judea and heading back to Galilee. And instead of taking the more sanctified route uh, around Samaria, he chooses to go right through it. And uh, since he's fully human, um, a point John repeats uh, repeatedly, he stops outside a small town of Sychar, which is possibly um, the city of Shechem that you read about in a number of places in the scriptures. It's at least very near to Shechem. And uh, it's about noon when Jesus stops. He's tired from his trip, so he sits down by a well. And a woman from the town, the nearby town, uh, comes up to him to draw water, and he begins a conversation with her. Now, this is really important. As you read John, pay very close attention to the many uh, allusions to the Old Testament that John subtly weaves into the narrative it's really amazing how he does that. And then also look for reoccurring themes like water, thirst, bread, light, mountains, trees, life, darkness. There's a whole host of them. And they're all significant. And that's my point, really. None of these things are random or coincidental. John is deliberately weaving all of these things together to prove that Jesus is the Messiah who was promised throughout the Old Testament. And the way he does it, it, it's so subtle, it requires us to slow down and contemplate what we're reading. Otherwise, we'll just rush through it in our hurry to fulfill our quota of Bible reading, and we'll miss most, if, if, most of the, the richness of what he's saying. Um, Elihu Lazorkin Eisenberg, in his commentary on John, made this very pertinent observation. He said, interpreting the Bible is a difficult task. We bring our past, our preconceived notions, our already formed theology, our cultural blind spots, our social standings, our gender, our political views, and many other influences to our interpretation of the Bible. And we'll see that here in this story. In short, he says, all that we are in some way determines how we interpret everything. This does not imply that the meaning of the text is dependent on its reader. The meaning remains constant. But how a reader or listener understands the text can differ greatly from person to person. 
So the meaning of a text, any text at all for that matter, only means what the originally meant to the writer. That does not change over time, cultures, whatever. What does change, though, and makes understanding the Bible difficult is the lens through which we read and interpret it. So Dr. Eli, as I'll call him from here on out because I can't pronounce his name, has written one of the most fascinating commentaries on the Gospel of John that I've ever read. And because of the Jewish lens through which he reads Scripture, he gives a different but I think a compelling explanation of John. One that to me makes more sense than any of the preconceived ideas that I have held in the past. And his will be the lens that colors my understanding of John chapter 4. So a little refresher um, background between the Jews and Samaritans. It's important to remember that the Samaritans were also the, the, uh, Jews. Um, they were both people groups. The Jews, the Judy, Judean Jews, and the Samaritans were both Israelites. The Samaritans called themselves the sons of Israel, the keepers. Uh, that is, they were the keepers of the faith. And according to Dr. Eli, Samaritan literally means keepers of the law, not people who lived in Samaria. The Judean Israelites rejected them because of the division that grew between the northern tribes of Israel and the lower tribes, Judah. And because they were, uh, the Samaritans were thought to have intermarried with Gentiles during the Assyrian captivity. And this led to centuries of deep animosity between those two groups. The Judean Israelites and the Samaritan Israelites did not go together like peas and carrots. Their relationship can be really compared to the hostility between the Sunni and the, the Shia Muslims today. They're both Muslims, but they two, the two totally uh, are opposed to one another. The Samaritan Israelites rejected the temple in Jerusalem on Mount Zion, and they built their own temple on Mount Gerizim, which Jesus and the Samaritan women could probably see from the well while they're having this conversation. Mount Gerizim was across a small valley from Mount Abel. And upon entering the promised land, Joshua divided the people. Half of them went up to Mount Gerizim and pronounced blessings on people who obeyed God and stayed faithful to him. The other half went up on Mount Ebal and pronounced curses on anyone who disobeyed. Uh, you can read about that in Deuteronomy chapter 11. They did, however, agree on two things. One, there's only one God, and they, there was only one book. However, the Samaritans recognized only the Torah, the books of Moses, and they rejected the, the entirety of the rest of the Old Testament. So in order to get the context of, of this encounter between the woman and Jesus, we have to revisit some of the verses that Dan addressed last week. So in verses 5 and 6, we're told that he, Jesus, came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Now, Here's another instance where John subtly weaves the Old Testament into the text. We most often miss it and miss its significance, but they didn't. Um, it's not known for certain if Sychar is actually the ancient town of Shechem, but even if it's not, it's very near that vicinity and near the foot of Mount Gerizim. Shechem, remember, was where Joshua assembled the tribes of Israel and challenged them to abandon their idols and follow God faithfully. And after making a covenant with them, he buried Joseph's bones there. Remember, Joseph died in Egypt, and he made them promise, when, when you leave this place, I want you to take my bones back to, to Israel and bury me there. That's in Joshua 24. Dr. Eli has an interesting view on why she was drawing water at noon, but we don't have time to dig into that. Dan went into that last week. So I want to start at verse 10 in our reading so we get a fuller picture of this encounter and then share some of Dr. Eli's understanding of the context. In, uh, starting at verse 10, it says, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. 
Sir, she said the woman, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of living water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to come here uh, to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. My understanding of this encounter has really followed the conventional line of thinking. You know, Jesus initiates a spiritual conversation with an unnamed Samaritan woman who does her best to deflect his arguments away from her sinful life. And then he finally plays the immorality card and tells her to go get her husband, to which she confesses to having five husbands and is now living with her boyfriend or something like that. But Dr. Eli has a a really a different interpretation that to me makes more sense of the textual and historical uh, context. He writes, because popular interpretation presupposes that the woman was immoral, it sees the entire conversation in light of that negative viewpoint. I would like to recommend a wholly different trajectory for understanding this story. It is possible that the Samaritan woman was not trying to avoid anyone. But even if she was, there are explanations for her avoidance other than feeling guilty about her sexual immorality. For example, people don't want to see see anyone when they're depressed. Depression was present in Jesus' time just as it is today. Maybe she was... Uh, maintaining bodily uh, distancing from one another like we're doing now. (laughs) Instead of assuming, he says, that the Samaritan woman changed husbands like gloves, there are other possible explanations. She most certainly, though, did not dump her five husbands. She would not have been allowed to initiate a divorce. The Torah only allowed the husband to initiate divorce it's more likely that her previous husbands abandoned her for whatever reason, not the other way around. So the popular view is that she is morally culpable, but that rather than that she is a victim of abuse, and I think that might be closer to the truth. Either view has weaknesses, but I think the latter view makes more sense in light of the following context. So Jesus said that, that she was living with a man who was not her, her husband. And so we assume that she's living with her boyfriend. But that's not stated in the text. A lo- as a lone woman in that culture, she would have been in economic deep kimchi for sure. It, it's possible that she needed help and maybe she lived with a distant relative or in some other undesirable arrangement in order just to survive. Dr. Eli makes the following suggestion. Jesus wasn't nailing her to the cross of justice, but instead letting her know that he knew everything about the pain she endured. This is certainly more in keeping with the Jesus we know from other instances in his life. If if I'm correct, he says, my suggestion that this woman was not a fallen woman, then perhaps we can connect her amazingly successful testimony to the village with John's unexpected but extremely important reference to the bones of Joseph. Now, it's important to to really get the picture. This conversation is happening near Joseph's burial place. John's first century readers would have instantly connected this with Joseph's story. Remember, some of the suffering that he experienced was self-inflicted, but not all of it. Some of this woman's predicament could also have been self-inflicted. But regardless of the cause, the suffering that Joseph experienced turned into the very thing that God used to save Israel and many others from starvation. John seems to be connecting those two stories to indicate that the Samaritan woman here will be the conduit through whom God saves these people. 
So rather than an immoral woman, it's possible, maybe even likely, that she was an emotionally alienated woman who felt unsafe and is ironically living in or near a city of refuge, which was Shechem, and is having a faith-finding, covenant-renewing conversation with God's royal son, Jesus, who has come to reunite all Israel with her God. She does so at the very place where the ancient Israelites renewed their covenant in response to God's words, sealing them with two witnesses. The stone that Joshua set up as a witness to the covenant they were making, Joshua 24, verses 26 through 27, and the bones of Joseph, also Joshua 24, verses 31, 32. The connection between Joseph and the woman doesn't end there, though. Just before Jacob died, he blessed Joseph, saying that he would be a fruitful vine climbing over a wall, Genesis 49, 22. Psalm 80, verse 8, talks about a vine being brought out of Egypt whose branches spread throughout the earth, eventually bringing salvation to the world. And in John 15, 1, Jesus identified himself as that true vine who was also symbolically brought out of Egypt in Matthew 2. So in his conversation with the Samaritan woman, Jesus, the promised vine, was in effect climbing over the wall of hostility between the Judean and the Samaritan Israelites in order to unite these two parts of his kingdom through his very person, his teaching, and his deeds. And Dr. Eli says, in deeply symbolic fashion, this conversation takes place at the very well that was built by Jacob to whom the promise was given. So then Jesus asks for a drink, to which she responds, how can you give me a drink? You don't even have a bucket. To her, Jesus was just one of those heretical Judean Jews. So he says to her in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you water. Now in her mind, as a Samaritan, the, the, the last place you would expect to receive the gift of God from was from a heretical Judean Jew. So she responds, verse 11, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where, you, where can you get this living water? Now I think that's a reasonable question concerning the fact that the well is probably close to 100 feet deep. Uh, and then she says, are, are you greater than our father Jacob? who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in, in them a spring of, of water welling up to eternal life. Then the woman says, Sir, give me this water so I don't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Now, when I started studying this passage, his next words to her really seemed very random. He told her, go call your husband and come back. Now, what does water have to do with husbands? I mean, it just seemed like, what? Where'd that come from? As Dr. Eli notes, uh, he let this nameless Samaritan woman know that he understood her struggles more fully than she thought. He did this by showing her that he was aware of the challenges she was enduring in her life. So in trying to help us see the narrative from a different perspective, he writes, Do you recall the seemingly obscure reference to Joseph's bones, which was very meaningful to first century Israelites, being buried near this very place? At the beginning of the story, John wanted us to remember Joseph. He was the man who suffered much in his life, but whose suffering was ultimately used for the salvation of Israel and the known world. Under Joseph's leadership, Egypt became the only nation that acted wisely by saving grain during the years of plenty and then being able to feed others during the years of famine. Genesis 41. It is highly symbolic that this conversation took place in the presence of a silent witness, the bones of Joseph. God first allowed terrible physical, psychological, and social injustice to be done to Joseph. Then he used this very suffering to greatly bless those who came in contact with him. Instead of reading this story in terms of Jesus nailing the immoral woman to the cross of God's standard of morality, we should read it 
in terms of God's mercy and compassion for the broken world in general and for marginalized people in particular like these Samaritans. So here's an alternative interpretation to the oral, uh, the immoral woman interpretation. Having seen Jesus, intimate knowledge of her miserable situation and his compassionate empathy, the woman felt secure enough to also break tradition and climb over the wall of forbidden associations. She makes a statement that invites Jesus' commentary on the subject of the theological difference between the Judeans and the Samaritans. She says, Sir, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. That's verses 19 and 20. Ancient Near East religions emphasized holy sites and often revered holy mountains. When invaders uh, would in, defeat an, in, an enemy, they typically destroyed the enemy's holy sites, their high places. Uh, you read about them all throughout the Old Testament. And they replaced them with their own shrines. The conflict between Jews and Samaritans over their respective holy sites was intense. The Samaritans rejected the Jerusalem temple and built their own on Mount Gerizim. And to the Jews, Jerusalem was the holiest place in the world and the only place where true worship could be conducted. One rabbi taught that those who died in Israel would be raised first, and then the righteous who died outside Israel would have to roll underground and return to Israel before being resurrected. Wow. <laughs> the woman is putting aside her animosity toward this Judean Jew. That's her view of him. And she's making a statement that reflects her understanding of how to connect with God. I don't think she expected a Judean Jew to say what he says next. He says, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his spirit worshipers must worship in spirit and truth verses 21 through 24 she must have been stunned by this statement jesus challenges the main point of the judean uh, samaritan divide mount gerizim versus mount zion and he's saying that the time has come for another type of worship altogether or another place of worship altogether if you will and in these verses here there's, there are four ends, uh, or the Greek would, is en, E-N, um, and, and he, he, in this paragraph, and I think, I think they're important, I think what he's saying is God will no longer be worshipped in Mount Gerizim, and she would have expected him to say that, uh, being a, Judea, uh, uh, a Jew from Judea. But then he says, God will no longer be worshipped in Jerusalem either. And he's saying that the choice between Mount Zion and Mount Gerizim, that she must, it's, it's not a choice between those two holy places. She now must look up to another mountain, a third mountain, so to speak, the Mount of Spirit and Truth. Jesus, right here, is redefining the location of worship. God is now to be worshiped in the place where he is present and it's not in Mount Gerizim, and it's not in Mount Zion. It's in him who is the truth incarnate. Jesus is the new focus of worship. Just as earlier he was portrayed as the true place of worship, the new tabernacle in John 1.14, the new Bethel, or the new house of God, John 1.51, and the new temple in, in John 2.19-22. Now, this woman really seems to be well-versed in the Torah, and, and Jesus appeals to a passage that both the Jews and Samaritans agreed upon. It's the passage where Jacob blesses his sons. It's in Genesis 49, verses 8 through 10. And there we read, Judah, your brothers, this is, this is uh, Jacob speaking, Judah, your brothers, will praise you. 
Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nation, nations shall be his. No one at that time thought of salvation like we do, Western, uh, individualistically. Uh, to them, salvation involved the domination of their enemies and security. And this was a prophetic blessing about the Messiah who was coming to rule the nations. Both the Jews and the Samaritans were waiting for him. Jesus was saying that the center of worship would be moved from a physical realm, Jerusalem, or Mount Gerizim, depending on their view, to the heavenly spiritual realm, namely himself. Um, you remember back in uh, Genesis 18, 12, Jacob's dream. He saw angels ascending and descending on the holy land where he is, was sleeping. But Jesus reinterpreted that dream to say that very soon the angels would be ascending and descending not on Bethel, which the Samaritans identified as Mount Gerizim, but upon the ultimate Bethel, the ultimate house of God, Jesus himself. Now, now the Samaritans rejected everything except the Torah. So the woman wouldn't have the prophets or any of the other writings to uh, provide her with a description of the Messiah. But in Deuteronomy 18, verses 18 and 19, which she did have, and, and she would have been familiar with that, it says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you, like Moses from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything that I command him. I myself will call account to anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. You can hear her, the, her expectation in her next words. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Now, her response makes perfect sense to me now. She leaves her water jar and runs back into town. In verse 29, she says to the people in town, Come and see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? She's saying, could this be the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18? So verse 30, they came out of town and made their way toward him. Verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. Now again, the usual take on her declaration, he told me everything I ever did, is he told me everything I ever committed, every sin I ever committed. You know, it's possible that this is just a simple statement that Jesus is making that he knew about her entire life. The phrase could be translated and understood as, he knows everything about me. I don't think she ran back to town to proclaim, this stranger told me about every sin I ever committed. <laughs> I think if she had told them that, they would have run in the opposite direction. He'll expose us too. Jesus is doing what she expected the Messiah to do. He is explaining everything to her. And it's evidence for her that he might really be the Messiah. Now, there's, really, there's a very interesting paradox in this story. The Samaritans accept the word, the testimony of this woman. The Galilean official takes Jesus at his word, it says, later in the chapter. The Samaritans of town believed Jesus' words after they convinced him to stay with them for two days, and, and he teaches them. But his own people, his fellow Judeans, they see his signs, and they reject him. I find that absolutely amazing. They're not just going off his words, they're seeing his signs. His, his, and all of his signs are authenticating his claims to be the Messiah, and they see it, but they reject it. Well, I think there's also another hidden layer of, uh, in this text. Why did John write this account of Jesus' life the way he did? Well, fortunately, we don't have to guess about that. He told us why in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in his book. 
These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. See, the, the events about Jesus' life about which John chooses to write are carefully selected to demonstrate that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the absolute source of life. Jesus made that claim himself in chapter 10, verse 10. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Life is, is what is uppermost in John's mind as he writes. He uses the word life 41 times as well as other allusions to life such as he will never die throughout the book. In my view, life is the dominant theme in John. So as you read the Gospel of John, it's important to stay focused on his purpose. He told you why he wrote it. He told you why he selected the information, the, the events that he selected. Every event he records, every sign he chooses to document is intended to point us to Jesus as the source of life. And as we've just seen, John masterfully weaves the Old Testament into a tapestry that reveals Jesus to us. The opening line of his gospel, remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That opening is not random. He deliberately echoes the opening words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he's subtly claiming that what we're reading is just as important as the story of creation. In fact, it's the fulfillment of the story of creation. So I think the main focus of this narrative is where do we go to find life? Not just physical life, that Jesus, but, but the life that Jesus called abundant life. Life that doesn't leave you thirsty shortly after you get a drink. Life that doesn't leave you hungry shortly after eating. Now, stick with me here, because it's going to seem like I, I zig off the, the, um, the, the rails here. My mind takes me back to Genesis. Remember, after God created the earth and filled it with everything mankind needs to live, he set them over it to care for it as his steward. They enjoyed an abundant life in the garden. In Genesis 2, 9, we read, The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So they are invited to eat freely of the trees. Eating from the tree of life makes God's own life available to them. But there was one restriction. Do not eat fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because it'll kill you. So here's the issue. Eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents taking authority to do what's right in your own eyes. It's essentially defining good and bad for ourselves. The serpent's temptation here is really interesting. The fruit of the tree was good and pleasing to the eye. Well, the same thing is said about all the other trees in the garden. It's, we're told it was desirable for gaining wisdom. God instructed them, how much more wisdom do they need? And then he says, you'll be like God. <laughs> they already were. They were created in the image and likeness of God. God had already provided all of those things for them freely. What's the problem? They're stepping away from the real tree of life and taking life on their own terms. They want the life the tree of life provides, but they want it on their own terms, not God's. Both trees were beautiful and desirable, but one of them was a false tree of life. And we see false trees of life throughout John. Physical water, well, it'll quench your thirst for a while, but it's only temporary. Physical bread, it'll satisfy your hunger, but just for a short time. Six men and the Samaritan woman's wife. Considering the culture she was in, it would have made perfect sense to attach herself to a man for security and income. Jesus is really asking her, how are those men quenching your thirst for life? Mount Gerizim, we're going to worship God on our terms. We reject that other thing. He conforms to us. We do not conform to him. 
Jesus claims to be the tree of life. And that's the point of the vine and branches discourse back in John chapter 15. He invited people to eat freely from him, to trust him, and be transformed by his life. He also exposed how corrupt people are, how much we love false trees of life. So he presents Israel with a new choice between life and death. But this time, not only do they choose death, the false tree of life, they also choose to attack the one who sustains all life. So Jesus is led up to the top of another hill where he dies upon another tree. The cross is the sad and violent result of people's desire to do what is good in our own eyes. Now, why would Adam and Eve trade the tree of life for the false tree of life? More importantly, why do we trade the, the, the tree of life or false trees of life? I think one of the reasons is that we place a higher value on the physical realm than the eternal because really that's all we know. Look at the reaction um, to, to Jesus when he raised Lazarus from the dead. In, in John 11, verses 45 through 48, it says, Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen, again, what Jesus did, believed him. But some of them, they're all seeing Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He'd been in the tomb for four days which was very important because by then corruption would set in and it wasn't possible to be resuscitated. They both see that. Some of them believe, but some of them, it says, went to the Pharisees and threw Jesus under the bus. They told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here's this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everybody will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. <laughs> their hearts were more attached to their physical positions and their possessions than the prospect of embracing Messiah who might cost them everything. Uh, there, you know, there's an old gospel song. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go now. <laughs> you know, when I'm having an epi epic day fishing, I don't want Jesus to return and interrupt it. Um, See, the physical realm, it, it's what we can see and touch and smell and, and handle and save and hoard. It is all, that's all we know. That's our, the totality of our experience. We read about the life we're promised after a physical death, but we have to take it by faith. What is it really like? And a good example of this comes out of, of uh, Steve, uh, De, De Saint, or Steve Saint's uh, experience bringing the Aka Indians uh, to this country for the very first time. And, and the first time they went in the grocery store, remember, there are hunters and gatherers out there. It's pretty hard living in the jungle when you're living off the land. And they go into a grocery store and they are absolutely blown away by the amount of food that's in it. All you got to do is walk around and grab it. And they say, thank you, and you go. Sitting back in the jungle, though, they couldn't have imagined the abundance of food that was in a simple grocery store. You know, I, I, I think I'm going to be embarrassed when I see Jesus and realize how many times I traded him for a false tree of life. Now, here's another thing. Here's where I have to go frequently because I have the same concerns or you could call them doubts that many of you might have as well. I believe life with Jesus will be awesome but I don't know it experientially. I have to take it by faith. So when I have doubts, I go to the bread of life discourse in John 6 where Jesus feeds the multitude. And after refusing to feed them, remember a second time, he bega they began leaving. And instead of offering them more bread, he offered them himself an eternal life. But they wanted more bread. Then he asked his disciples, are you leaving too? And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus, there's no plan B. I have no place else to go but you. You are the source and sustainer of life. Nothing else is. When stuff happens that threatens the things we depend on for our lives, like this coronavirus, it can really shake us to the core. 
And like the woman in the story, left husbandless, she can't see how she's going to live. So in desperation, she grabs at anything that offers hope, even a false tree of life. Jesus offers her, li- offers her living water, but he's an unlikely source of life. He doesn't even have a bucket. When you start feeling like that, uh, that, that I, I can only tell you to embrace Peter's response. Where else can we go? You, Jesus, have the words of life. Embrace those words and hang on to that truth for dear life. It looked hopeless to Mary and Martha when her brother, their brother Lazarus died. Well, Jesus told them, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? There you have it. Will you trust that Jesus will supply you with life no matter what everything else around you looks like? Will you depend on him, the tree of life? Or will you put your confidence in a false tree of life because it looks like it'll give you what you want? Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace, especially during the times that test our faith. Amen. God bless you. Use this time of uh, withdrawal from normal activities to really dive deep into the Gospel of John. It is a rich, rich study. See ya.